Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for sending Jesus into this world as the Messiah and by his resurrection, the Lord of all creation. We praise you, Father, for the plan of redemption, this plan of salvation, this plan of redeeming the world from the curse of sin and, from re and redeeming us from the curse of sin as well. And we praise you for already starting that salvation, that redemption in our lives through faith in Jesus Christ. We confess to you, Heavenly Father, that we tend to to be self-centered. It comes so naturally to us. We tend, Heavenly Father, not to be a people that deny ourselves. That is so unnatural to us. We tend to bend the truth for the sake of our own well-being. That comes so naturally to us. But speaking the truth in love is so difficult for us. Father, forgive us, but more than that, more than that, make us the people that you want us to be. Help us to cooperate with you in that. Help us to want to be the people that you want us to be. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the Scriptures. And that if we read them, they offer to us words of life, abundant life. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for sending us your Holy Spirit who teaches us your word, who applies it to our lives, who helps us to see where we need it in our lives, who convicts us and comforts us. Thank you for establishing the church. And we know, Lord, we know that the church is made up of human beings who have a sinful nature, and that even when we come to Christ in faith, that that curse of sin remains with us and we continue to struggle with our sinful nature. But Lord, we recognize that that's what the church is for. It is for people who struggle with their sinful nature, who bring it to Christ on a daily basis, and who seek to encourage each other in following Jesus and in sharing the message of Jesus with others. Father, thank you for those who have been our Christian mentors in the past, Sunday school teachers, youth group sponsors, small group Bible study leaders, people who have been instrumental in helping us grow in our Christian faith. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the blessings of life, even to be alive, to wake up on a day like this where the sun is shining, the snow is white and hanging upon the trees, the sky is blue. It is a beautiful day that you've given us. We thank you for it. We thank you, Father, for the gift of health and strength that we can wake up on a day like this and feel good. And we haven't a worry in the world. We're blessed. Thank you. But Lord, we are mindful. We do remember that there are family members and friends, fellow Christians and neighbors who have a worry in this world, and maybe more of them. Lord, we pray for them. We pray that you will hold them in the hollow of your hand. We pray, Heavenly Father, for Gladys Van Veldeisen as she has surgery this week, that all will go well, and this surgery will finally give her knee uh, that her knee will feel good, it will regain its strength, and she won't have that pain anymore. We pray, Heavenly Father, for Henry Van Heuvelen. We pray that he will be safe and healthy at home, and that in his daily trip to the hospital for those antibiotics, that he will be kept free from infection, regain his strength, and he will be able to be safe in his home. We pray, Heavenly Father, for all who are elderly, who are shut in, who are confined to uh, assisted living facilities or nursing home facilities. The vitality of life because of the advancement of years has left them. 
Lord, we pray that they might still find fulfillment, happiness, joy in their lives. We pray for little Levi Thorson, Lord. Continue to strengthen him and, and his parents for Grant and Tara. Hold them in the hollow of your hand. And may the day come soon when Levi can come home and they can have their son home with them. And that they can move forward in their lives as a family. We pray for those who are expecting the birth of a baby. Thank you, Lord, for this wonderful privilege of bringing another child into the world. We pray for these young wives, soon to be mothers, that you will bless them, give them a safe, problem free delivery, and that we could all rejoice together with them in the birth of their child. And Lord, we pray for Joan Witzel this week as she goes to the hospital on Thursday. We pray, Heavenly Father, that once those doctors get in there, that they will see that they can do this, that they can remove this tumor, that they can get that troublesome growth out of there, and that they, with treatment further following, that they can give Joan a good report of health and expectation for the future. And Lord, while she's going through this, we pray that you will hold those other signs of cancer in her body at bay, that they will not advance, that they will not grow, and so that Joan can get through this so that she can begin to attack that. And Lord, we pray that you will place your hand of healing upon her body, your powerful, gracious hand of healing. Lord Jesus, you who touched the lives of people who couldn't walk and they walked, people who couldn't see and they could see, people who couldn't hear and they began to hear, this disease of cancer can also be touched by you and disappear. We pray for that, for Joan and for Cal. We pray that as Cal goes to the doctor tomorrow and they consult <clears throat> about treatment, Lord, Lord, whatever you wish to use, Use those doctors if that is your desire. But we pray for him as well, that he might experience health and hope for the future. Father, <clears throat> thank you that we can pray. Thank you that we can pray for those who serve you. We pray for Rob, Rosaboom, Rise Ministries, for the Rise Fest and its preparations, for his speaking engagements, for his radio program. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you will fill him with the power of your spirit, spiritual strength to speak, physical strength to continue with his schedule, and that you will provide him with the resources that he needs also to continue in this ministry. We pray, Father, for Matt and Jackie Hutchcraft. We pray that you will bless them in their, their last remaining weeks here in the States and as they return to Russia, that they will be refreshed and healthy and ready to enter into their work again. And Lord, we pray for Beth Blankers. Thank you for her work with college students in the ministry of Campus Crusade for Christ. We pray that you will fill her with your spirit and may she see fruit for her labors. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our scripture today is John chapter 10, verses 1 through 10. And these are the words of Jesus. I tell you the truth. The man who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, he is a thief and a robber. The man who enters by the gate is the shepherd of his sheep. The watchman opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow them, him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but they did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. All who ever came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief 
comes only to steal and to kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Let's watch a DVD for a few moments. I spent a lot of time with my grandkids and my husband and my mother. I would spend it with my family and friends. I'd spend uh, every, every minute I could with my family. I love them to death and I don't get to that we can come today and read your scripture and we just pray that you send your Holy Spirit to open our hearts and our minds to receive your message and help us apply this message to our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks, Greg. Every once in a while, if I take a walk, it's not unusual for me to walk through East Lawn Cemetery and just kind of weave my way through all the little lanes in East Lawn. And one of the things that I do is I look at the graves there and I see graves of people that I have done their funeral. And I think about them. And I think about their life and um, the last days of their lives. But I also see the graves of people that I don't know and I see those names and I see certain things on those graves about those people that tells me something about them. Though I don't know them, I might find out that they had three or four children. Their children's names are listed on the graves quite often. Or there might be a scripture passage on their grave and I understand that they were probably a Christian. Or there might be um, something indicated on their grave that they were a veteran, uh, uh, served in the military. But one thing that's on all of the graves, it's common for everyone, is the date of their birth and the date of their death. That's what is on everyone's grave. It makes me wonder about their life. It makes me wonder about what kind of a person they were. What were their interests? What did they enjoy? What were their mistakes, their frustrations? How did they die? Um, were they happily married? Uh, we just don't know those things because that's not on that grave. Ah, but wait a minute. It is. Everything about that person is actually inscribed on their grave because Usually, there's the date of their birth and the date of their death, and in between is a dash. And that dash represents their life. Everything about them happened in that dash. Now, those of you who are a little bit older, like me, we realize how fast life goes by. I can't believe I'm at this place in life where I've raised my children and now I've got grandchildren and I can't believe that it's all gone by so quickly. Yes, when you're in it, it seems to be, take a long time. But when you get a little bit older and you look back on it, you think, man, oh man, it went so fast. It dashed by. There's not a whole lot we can control about what's on our tombstone. The date of our birth, we can't control. The date of our death, we can't control. But there's a lot about that dash that we can control. That's our life. And life is made up of decisions we make every day about how we're going to live that day. For the next several weeks, we're going to try to answer the question, how would I live if I knew that I would be dead in 30 days. How would I live those 30 days if I knew that's all the time I had left? Jesus knew that his life on earth was short and he was focused on fulfilling the purpose of his life. He knew he had only 33 years and so he focused on fulfilling his purpose. He knew in those last three years of his life, that that was his earthly ministry. That's when he really focused on preaching and doing miracles. He knew in that last year that it was the last year of his ministry. He knew that in the last month 
That was the last 30 days of his life. He knew, especially that last week, he really poured himself into his disciples. Much of the Gospel of John, the whole book, is about the last week of his life. And Jesus lived purposefully, intentionally throughout his life, and especially in that last month. And he lived by several principles. He focused on several principles, four universal principles that can transform how we live. And we're going to look at those principles for the next several weeks. And we're going to summarize them today. The first one is that Jesus lived passionately. And we need to live passionately as Jesus did. No one would deny that Jesus lived passionately. <clears throat> his passion, his food, as he says, was to do the will of him who sent him and finish his work. That was Jesus' passion. To do God's work. To fulfill God's will. John 17, 4, I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Jesus came to the end of his life and he said, because I lived passionately in my life, I finished the work that you gave me to do. God created us to live passionate lives. Not just to let them pass by. Not just to coast through life. Not just to come to each day and let it fritter itself away, but to live passionately, not casually, purposefully. John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus said, I came that you, that they, that people who follow me might have life, life, and have it to the full. And how does one get that life? Jesus said, I lived my life Passionately, I fulfilled the work God gave me to do. Invite me into your life and you'll experience this life. This life of passion. You can't live it. Oh, you can, you can have fun. You can do fun things. You can do exciting things temporarily. But you can't live the life I'm talking about, Jesus said, unless I live in you. This is the testimony. God has given us eternal life and this Life can be found in his Son. He who has the Son has life. You don't have to wait until you die to get it. You have life. And those who do not have the Son of God don't have this life. Life passes by so quickly. Don't wait for the future to really live. Don't wait till next week to really live. Don't wait to retire to really live. Don't wait for vacation to really live. Live passionately. Every single day. Every day is a gift. Every day is the only day and time that we have. Live passionately. Jesus loved completely. And so we, if we're to live like there's no tomorrow, we need to love completely as Jesus did. John 13, verse 1. It was just before the Passover feast, and Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world, to go to the Father. Having loved his own, he always had loved them who were in this world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. So on that last night that he was with them, the last night, the last moments together, in just a few hours from now, Jesus wouldn't even be with them anymore. He might be able to see a few of them from the distance. He might be able to see John at the foot of the cross. But his life with them was over. And so what does he do? He focuses on them like a laser beam. He serves them. He washes their feet. He talks to them. And he tells them the most important things that they need to know. There's no tomorrow. This is it. And what does he tell them? A new commandment I give you. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. We know this. We hear this all the time. Love is the greatest commandment. Jesus was asked by 
um, the lawyers of his day, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength and mind. And that's the first and greatest commandment. The second is, like it, love your neighbor. Love people as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. In other words, if you keep these two commandments, love the Lord and love people, you can keep all the rest of them. You don't even have to know all the rest of them. You don't have to know the Ten Commandments. You don't have to know what the Bible says. If you know these two, love God and love your neighbor, you'll be able to fulfill all the rest by doing those two. Love. Love. Love completely. At the end of life, how much money we've made or how much money we have, that's good and that's important. But that's not going to make any difference. How much we've loved is what's going to make the difference. We come to the end of life and all of our accomplishments and all of the things we've been able to do, all of the trophies we've won and all of the awards we've gotten, now that's good and that's important. But that's not going to matter. What's going to matter is how much we've loved. Get to the end of life and how much land we've got or how much machinery we've got or how many cars we've got in the garage or how many motorcycles or how many guns I've got in my gun cap. All that's not going to make any difference. What's going to matter is did I love in the midst of doing all that stuff and having all that stuff and playing with all that stuff and using all that stuff? Did I love in the midst of doing that? In John 13, verse 8, Paul says, love never fails. You see, if in our business we truly practice that business with love for each other, love for our employees, love for our employer, love for our fellow employees, love for the person that would buy our product and how we made that product, if we practiced our business with love, it would never fail. That business would be successful. If in the midst of our high school experience, our college experience, we loved while we studied, we loved while we got involved in our activities, we loved while we went to the ball games, we loved while we played ball or played the instrument or sang in the choir, whatever we did in the midst of high school and college, if we practiced love, it would not fail. We would be a successful student, a successful athlete, a successful musician. Success comes through loving people. So, if you're really going to live successfully, passionately, we've got to love completely. And as you know, love gets complicated. But that's where it's at. How can I love completely in the midst of this circumstance that I'm in? Jesus also learned humbly. So let's learn humbly in the midst of life as Jesus did. Philippians 2, verses 6 through 8, being in very nature God, Jesus was God, but he didn't grasp that. He didn't hang on to it and say, I'm not going to give this up. No, he made himself nothing. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death. The writer of the book of Hebrews says, although he was the Son of God, he learned obedience from what he suffered. You know what? When we have to be humbled, when we humble ourselves, when something happens to us that humbles us, that's kind of a form of suffering. Because we don't like to be humbled naturally. But that's where the greatest learning takes place and we're called to be imitators of Christ to learn Christ like character and one of the most important character qualities of Jesus was his humility now in the midst of that humility he could sometimes be very strong and bold but he also showed that humility and the scriptures tell us that he learned humility by the things that he suffered don't be afraid of suffering. Don't be afraid of self-denial. That's a form of suffering. Don't be afraid of taking the back seat. That's a form of denying yourself. 
because that's the greatest place of learning. Be teachable. Listen. You can learn something. Listen to the circumstances of life. Listen to the people around you. Learn humility. And learn humbly. In Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, which is a very well-known passage of Scripture, we read, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't trust in yourself. Don't trust in your ability to defend yourself. Trust in the Lord. Entrust yourself to Him. And do not lean on your own understanding of things. In other words, don't rely upon yourself self-defense, self-lifting um, self up, um, putting self one out in front. Trust in the Lord and trust yourself to Him. Let Him put you where He wants you. And in all your ways, in everything you do, in all your decisions, acknowledge Him. In other words, consult Him. And He will make your path straight. Give God the first day of your every week. That's Sunday. Give it to Him. Humbly. Humble yourself. It's not about us. It's about Him. Humble yourself the first day of every week, Sunday. The first hour of every day in your quiet time with Him, your relationship with Him. Give Him the first hour of every day. Humble yourself to do that. Suffer to do that. It will require a form of suffering. I'm going to have less time for this, less time for sleep, less time to get ready. Suffer through that and humble yourself for that because it's going to be worth it. The first hour of every day, the first portion of your income. Yeah, suffering. In all your ways, acknowledge Him. In your own understanding, don't rely upon that. Your own understanding may say, I can't afford to give God something. You rely upon your own understanding, and that's probably what you're going to think. God says, you can't afford not to put me first in your life, the first hour of every day, and the first of your, every, your income. And give him first consideration in every decision. Every decision. Where am I going to live? What is my life work going to be? What, uh, how am I going to, who am I going to go out with? What are we going to do when I go out with him or her? Um, every decision of life, line it up in consideration with the will of God. Learn that. Humble yourself to receive that, to live like that. And your life, our life, my life, will be the fuller. And finally, leave boldly as Jesus did. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane. He said to his disciples, The hour is near. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Let's go. Here comes my betrayer. He went and faced them. Jesus left a legacy of strength, bold faith, unafraid of death. We're never really ready to leave this world until we know how to really live. So are we living passionately? Are we loving completely? Are we learning humbly? And are we ready to leave boldly? Jesus did everything that was necessary for us to leave this world boldly. And when we come to the table of the Lord, we celebrate that. He paid the penalty for our sins. He came to live in our hearts to let us live a victorious life. I came to give you life, life to the full. When we come to the table of the Lord, we celebrate that. We remember what He did. It is finished. We don't have to add anything to it. We simply have to follow it and accept Him. And we receive it. When you come to the table, you receive what Jesus Christ has done for you. And so this morning, we will come to the table together. If you are not 
a member of First Reformed Church, but you're worshiping with us this morning, but you have accepted Christ as your Savior, and you are a member of another Christ-centered church, we invite you to participate in this sacrament with us. We're going to start with the folks in the balcony.